Uh, they don't necessarily connect to uh, uh, any long series. We'll start another series next week heading into Christmas, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit this week about gratitude as we're heading into the Thanksgiving. That seemed especially appropriate, and I wanted to talk about uh, what I see in Scripture as, as kind of the healing power of gratitude, and, and the Bible talks about that at some length, and and I wanted to talk about that too if I could. So uh, there's a story in Luke 17. I found a, 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 a old kind of painting looking of it where Jesus is, is confronted by 10 lepers. Now, if you don't, um, I mean, most of us broadly know what leprosy is, but, 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 the, but the headache of leprosy, of course, beyond the fact that it was, it was super contagious and, and terminal eventually and just caused all sorts of uh, physical and, and, and mental problems, besides all that, which was, was awful enough as it's by itself, uh, the, the Jews believed that leprosy made you unclean. So as soon as uh, a person was, was found to be leprous, uh, they lost all their relationships. Now, we saw a little bit of that during uh, COVID, I mean, where you'd have to go to a, a hospital bed and, and your friends or loved ones couldn't come see you, or a funeral where people couldn't come in and, 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 and grieve, grieve with the family. But this would be like that, but times a times hundred, times a thousand. I mean, you would have a family, and then you'd get this diagnosis, and they would all abandon you. They, would, they just couldn't be with you anymore. If you had children, they would never talk to you again. If you had if you had a, a wife or a husband, that would be the end of that. You would lose your business. You just would lose everything. And, and it was a disease that would not kill you quick, but was certainly going to kill you. And so over the last uh, long stretch of your life there, uh, you'd just be alone, other than the company of other lepers, other people who were in the same situation that you were in. And these 10 lepers are together, and they see Jesus at a distance. And so they, they call out to him, uh, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And, uh, and Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, now uh, in the Old Testament, for this unclean thing, if you thought you had leprosy, but you weren't sure, there's something on my skin there, I'm not sure what that is, you'd go show the priest, and the priest would determine whether it was really leprosy or not. And if it was leprosy, of course, then you've you got to be abandoned, it got to be out. But if it wasn't leprosy, then they'd say, oh, nothing to worry about, you know, you can go back to your... And so, so sometimes it could be misdiagnosed. Well, these are guys who had leprosy for a long time, and, you know, you don't normally get better from leprosy, but Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And so these guys do. They all, they all head that direction. And as they're going, it says, as they're on the way, they're healed. Maybe they don't notice it at first. They're, they're kind of hustling to get to the priest, and, and one of them notices, wait a minute, I'm, and, and they realize that they're better. They realize that they're, that they're healed. And so, and so it says that one of them, the, the, the ten guys are healed, that one of them uh, turns around and, uh, let's see, comes back. And, and says thank you to Jesus. And Jesus is kind of caught by that. And he says, didn't we heal ten? You know, where's the other nine? And, and, uh, and, and now, the other nine aren't necessarily bad guys. Jesus told them to go see the priest, and that's what they were doing. But, but Jesus pays special attention to this one guy who comes back and says thank you. you know? the, the, this is, and he says to him, that, that, that guy, he says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Now, you could read this a couple different ways. You could read it like, oh, I guess the other guy's got leprosy again. I don't think that's what he's saying. I don't think that's, there's no indication that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is, you, you saying thank you like you did, you showing gratitude like you did, has healed you inside. So you're not just healed on the outside, now you're healed on the inside too, that, that, that there's something about saying uh, thank you. There's something about, about doing that that actually heals you up inside. Now, as, as parents, we understand that kind of instinctively. I mean, if you, if you, Christmas comes along and, and uh, Aunt, Aunt Ethel has made uh, your kids uh, sweaters, and they're great big, bulky, ugly-looking sweaters, but, uh, and your kids aren't excited about it, but you make them put them on, put the sweaters on there, and what do you say to your Aunt Ethel? Oh, thank you, Aunt Ethel. And they, and they don't really mean it, and you know they don't really mean it. I mean, there's no mystery about it. They don't really mean it, but, but, but there's something about saying it, you mean as a parent, you make them say it. This is, this is about being a good person. This is about becoming the kind of person that as a parent you want to raise. You, you hope that they learn this thing. And Jesus kind of picks, I know it seems kind of childish, but, but there's something about just saying thank you that has the potential to really heal your heart more than just the leprosy. And everybody you meet is broken by sin, right? I mean, everybody that you, you run across is, is broken by, by sin. I mean, sometimes you can see it real obvious, 
well, like a disease. You know, there's, they've got something wrong with them. You can see it when you walk up to them. Or, or maybe uh, life has been really hard on them. Their life choices have been really hard on them. And you can just see it when you look at them that here's somebody in, in kind of a bind. Sometimes your sin shows up like that. But most of the time it doesn't. Most of the time you could be with somebody who's really proud or really angry or really lustful or really greedy or whatever else. And, and, and you won't notice it. You know, it takes some time for the, the rough edges to start showing up, and then, and then you start to realize it. But you've never, you've never locked eyes with anybody who wasn't just broken by sin, who wasn't covered up with sin. And, and, uh, and, and uh, sometimes maybe you'll have a, a friend. I've had this happen before. A friend starts dating somebody, and uh, you meet the person they're dating, and your first thought is, wow, they're nuts. They're, they're, I mean, there's something wrong here. And, 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 so, and it's your friend. Who's, who's dating them, and so you, you don't want your friend to go down. But, so you talk to your friends. Hey, listen, you know, I think this is really, this is not the one. This is not, what are you doing? This is awful. And they might say back to you, yeah, I know they're a lot, but, 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 but I think I can fix them, they say. How does that work out usually? Yeah, I know they're a lot, but I think I can, I can fix them. Well, you can't, right? None of us can fix people. People can't, we can't fix people. And, and it's, just, it's just terrible and stupid to think that you can, though people can get fooled. But Jesus can fix people. Jesus can fix people. He can take somebody who's broken by sin and, and make them less broken and ultimately make them unbroken. And, and, uh, and Jesus can do that. And, and he does that for this guy. This guy says, thank you. And, and Jesus says, your faith is making you well. I think it's just really, it's just a cool Cool deal. You know what these lepers, when they're, when they're heading away, there's, maybe leper number one is really angry. He's been angry for years, you know, ever since he got the diagnosis. Maybe even before the diagnosis. He's just, just always an angry dude. And, and anger, is, you can feel anger. You know, like if, if, if ten guys are playing basketball and one of them's getting ticked off, getting hit too much, or, or feels like he's not hitting his shots like he should and he's getting mad, everybody else feels it. One angry person, it's contagious too. It starts spreading. One guy's anger leads two other guys to get mad, and before too long, everybody's hot. And, 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 and this guy's angry, and he's a leper, and he's angry, and he's mad at God, and he's mad at his family, and he's mad at everybody else, mad at how the world's treated him. And he's going to the priest, and he's healed. Like he's walking to the priest, and he's made well, right? But he's still angry. And he's probably excited in the moment, but none of the sins changed. None of the sin habits have changed, and, and uh, he's still broken by it. He's still mad at God. He still feels like God's cheated him. Finally, I can get some of my life back maybe, but he still thinks God took something from him. He's still mad at his family. You know, I'm going to marry somebody else, even prettier than she was, and then, then she'll regret what she did, and, you know, it's, it's still poison. Maybe one of the lepers is really proud. Proud's his thing, and he thinks he's better than other people, and even when he's with the other lepers, he thinks they're kind of beneath him, right? He, he tries to eat first. He tries to make them do stuff for him. He won't listen to them. He's dismissive when they have complaints or grumbles. You think you have it tough. Let me tell you what tough is. And, it, and they're all lepers, you know. It's a crazy conversation to have. And, and they're, heading, they're heading to the priest, and, and he gets better. Well, he's still proud because sin's not tied to your circumstances. Sin's a heart thing. And so, and so what's he thinking? I'm going to get away from these losers, you know? And you're one of the losers. You're, you're as much of a loser. No, I'm not anything like these guys. I'm going to go hang out with better people. I'm going to advance myself and get with the right kinds of people. I'm going to be somebody again. Maybe somebody's greedy in there, which is kind of a weird thing because lepers, none of them have anything. But one guy is really prideful of his stuff. He won't let anybody share his stuff. And, and he's leaving and he's healed. His leprosy is gone, but he's still broken by sin. And he's thinking, if I can just get the right house or the right, the right wife or the right, the right horse or whatever you know, he's after, if I can get the right things, then people will look at me and say, man, that's somebody, and then I'll have it made. And, and it's just sin still breaks you. But this guy, the one, he goes back to Jesus and he says, he says thank you. And Jesus says, just in doing that, you know, such a subtle, stupid little thing. It has healing power. I don't want to think about that today. I want to think about that, that notion. Because when we come in here, every one of us is broken by sin. You know, when people say the church is full of hypocrites, I don't know if that's true, but I know there's at least one hypocrite here. Because I know how I am. So, so, so 
I come in here, and you come in here, and, and we stand here with Jesus, and there's this hope that Jesus can fix us. And I think gratitude is part of what unlocks that door. And I want to think about that a little bit today, too, if we can. So one verse I really want to focus on, but I've got to give you the context of the verse first. So it's all, it's all in Colossians uh, chapter 3. I'm going to get to verse 17. That's the verse I really want to think about, but, but, but I've got to get the context first so you kind of see what Paul's talking about. Paul says in Colossians, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen uh, people, holy and dearly loved, he says, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and, and gentleness and, uh, and patience. So he, says, he says, first of all, remember who you are. You're, 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 you're chosen by God, you know, and, and God has set you apart. That's what holy means, and, and you're dearly loved. I mean, God loved you so much, he took a crown of thorns, took nails in his hands and feet for you. God, God has prioritized you so high you can't even imagine, and because you're that, you're, you're chosen, you're holy, you're dearly loved, he says, clothe yourselves with these things. When you think about clothing yourself, Clothing yourself, it, 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 um, again, think about the little kids, and Aunt Ethel's giving them the sweaters, right, and, they're, and they're, they're wearing the sweaters. It's one thing when they're five and six and seven, you know, and they're standing there for a picture, and they get their picture taken, and then, and, but it's different if they're like 18, 17, 16, somewhere in there, right, and they get their sweater from Aunt Ethel. What do you say? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ethel. And then, but then, then the kid catches you in the hallway. Why do you make me do that? What? Say thank you. I mean, look at this thing. I'm not going to wear this. And, and he says, he says why, why do you make me do that? I, just feel, I feel stupid saying that. She, shouldn't be, she should be put away is what she should be, making stuff like this. And you're making me go out there and say thank you to her. And, and he feels like a, like a fraud, like a hypocrite. You know, why am I saying thank you when I'm not really? And that happens as you get older, right? As a kid, you'll say it just to, get, just to move on. Okay, thank you, and you move on. But as, an adult, as you get a closer adult, I don't feel like saying thank you as much. I don't feel like, like getting in there. And so this clothe yourself is kind of an instructive idea here. You know, they just put these clothes on. It's like uh, uh, almost like pretend to be this, you know. Uh, choose it whether you feel it or not. Uh, one of our elders, a guy named Brian, uh, he, uh, during COVID, had to work from home. And he said one of the hardest parts about going back to real work, leaving the house and having to go back to the office, was he had to put on hard pants. And, uh, and I remember when he said that, I thought that was a funny, a funny line. He'd gotten used to soft pants. And have to go back and wear hard pants was such a, was such a, well, this is like, this is like putting on, but why do you put on hard pants? Because you're with folks, right? You can't be wearing sweatpants when you're out with folks. So you can, I mean, you can do it with like with some folks, but not with all the folks. I mean, sometimes you've got to, you know, take it up a half a notch. And so, and so it's that, right? I'm going to be out with, with people, so, so I'm going to put these things on. And it's not being a hypocrite. It's just making a decision to, to wear hard pants, making a decision to dress up just a little bit as, as I go in and I'm dealing with people. And all these things are important. This compassion, is a, it's a, the, the Greek word implies your gut. In fact, the King James, the King James translation, it says, have bowels of mercy. King James was written in 1611. I'm sure that made a lot of sense in 1611. But they're trying to make sense of that word that it affects your, your inside. And so when he says compassion, let your heart get affected by that. I mean, really spend some time and think about what the other person's going through. He says uh, kindness and, 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 and gentleness and humility. Humility and gentleness were not really considered virtues in the ancient world. It was, it was considered like losing and nobody really looked up to that. And even in America today, I, know, I mean, people say they like humble people. The people don't necessarily like being a humble person. That's kind of a harder deal. Because being a humble person means that you're willing to lose some. You're not always going to get your way. It's not always going to go the direction you want it to go. Sometimes, uh, and it can be in big and small things. I mean, you shouldn't be the one who always picks the restaurant. You shouldn't be the one who always decides what we're going to talk about. You shouldn't be the one who always gets your way. I mean, part of humility and gentleness is learning how to take a half a step back sometimes. And he says, clothe yourself with that and, and with patience, with the long suffering, and, 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 and make a decision that you're going you're gonna to think about the other person first. And if you have to think about it like putting hard pants on, then, then, then that's what it is. I mean, just for a minute, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do like this for you, right? I could wear what I want to wear, but I'm going to dress up just a little bit to be presentable here uh, with you. You know, there's a, when my kids were little, the, 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 um, 
we would watch video cassettes because it was way back in the you know a long time ago for streaming and we put the video cassettes in and we'd watch the same video cassette and just as soon as it got done we just rewind it and watch it again because had little little kids want to watch the same movie over and over again and we had the Lion King uh, video cassette and we watched Lion King and I could almost quote all of Lion King still it's been I probably haven't seen it for 10 years or 20 years but I could still quote almost all of it and there's if you remember the Lion King Mufasa he's the king of the beast he's the king of the jungle and uh, but he gets killed he gets betrayed and at his brother Scar, which is right there, you name somebody Scar, you know they're probably bad news. And Scar comes in and he, and he kills Mufasa, has him in it's an awful thing. And Simba runs for his life. He's scared and he's a little, little lion and he takes off. Well, he gets to be a big lion. And, and he misses his dad, and he misses the old ways, but he feels like it's too much, too much to went under the bridge. You know, he can't go back now, and he kind of feels guilty, like it's his own fault that his dad died, and he can't go back. And one night, he's out there on the savanna, and he, he sees this vision of his dad, like the, Mufasa's up there in the stars. And Mufasa says, you're more than you've become. You need to remember who you are. And then he fades off, remember, remember. And it is, it's a really powerful scene there. As, as far as cartoons go, it's a really powerful, powerful scene. But, but remember who you are, right? Okay, well, part of this is what, what he's getting into here. Uh, the next thing, he says, bear with each other. Forgive one another. If you've got a grievance against anyone, forgive like the Lord forgave you. Remember who you are. Jesus forgave you for everything. Remember, remember you think about the difference between God's forgiveness and, and ours. Think about the, 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 how God forgave you and how you want to forgive. God held back his anger for a long time when we sinned against him. He still does. You still can go out and do some foolish thing, and the lightning's not going to strike. I mean, you're not going to probably have a coronary and die right there. I mean, it, God holds back his anger. Uh, even when we sorely provoke him. God reaches out to us to, to bring forgiveness, but I usually won't make the first move. If somebody hurts me, I wait for them to come say they're sorry, and then maybe I'll say I'm sorry too, or I'll forgive them. But I don't usually want to, but God goes first. And God didn't just go first. He goes knowing that we'll probably do it again, sometimes in exactly the same way. God's forgiveness is so complete that he grants adoption. Doesn't just forgive, but says, won't you move into my house? Won't you tie yourself to me? Won't let me tie myself to you? I usually wouldn't do that. I want to hold people's past as leverage against them. God bore all the penalty for my sin. He paid for all of it on the cross. I, so I might forgive somebody, but if they damage my property, I want them to pay for it. They'll pay for it and I'll forgive them, but I'm not going to pay for it and forgive them. God keeps reaching out to me even if I turn him down over and over again. God doesn't hold probation over me. I'll forgive you, but let's see if it takes. I do that to people. God restores me completely. And so you think of that Lion King thing. Remember, remember who you are here. God forgave you of all of it. And he didn't hold you in probation. He took you into his family. I mean, it was all let go. And again, here's the thing. I'm not pretending like I have this all together. And I'm, I'm not even trying to pretend like that you could do a false kind of double uh, reverse psychology humility thing where, oh, wow, he's so humble to know this. I mean, we all know this about ourselves, right? I mean, I'm not where I need to be on this thing. But part of remembering what he did for me is hopefully it inspires me to be willing to do a little bit more of it for somebody else. I mean, after all he's done for me, surely I can show grace to somebody else, particularly to somebody in the church or in my family, or I mean, particularly somebody who I'm tied to, I mean, I mean how, how much more should I be willing to show grace to somebody else after all he's done for me? Well, part of it is I don't, I don't remember it. And even when I do remember it, I'm tempted to say, well, I was pretty good people already. Because like, you always think you're good. Hitler thought he was good people. You always think you're good people, right? Um, and he took me back. And he puts up with me. Uh, 1 John 4, 19, it's an easy verse. You know it whether you think you do or not. It says, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. 
The reason we can do any of it is because of his grace and compassion to us. And so he says, forgive like that. And I, I'm not going to lie, it's hard. This last thing, over all those virtues, put on love, and it's that word agape love, which is stronger than erotic love. It's stronger than brotherly love. It's stronger than a love that a mother has for a child. It, it's a love that lays down its life completely without asking anything back. There, there's, there, there's, there, it's, it's a complete giving love without taking anything back. And he says, this is who we're to be. When we remember what Jesus did, well, this is who we're supposed to be. And we give back, we give back more. We, we just completely shower the other person with grace. And it's a tough thing. I mean, I talked about that last week with the, with the anger sermon. The hardest thing in the, the Bible that he asks us to do, and it pops up lots of different ways, is to forgive, to show grace, to, to turn the other cheek. I mean, it's just a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to trust uh, that they won't just hurt you again. And yet this is the standard that he set, and he tells us to be that way too. And then he goes on. He says, he says and let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, for all of you who struggle with worry or anxiety or depression, I mean, what a promise that is. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Whether you would struggle with those things, like, you know, clinically, I mean, how many of us struggle with worry? How many of us struggle with, with, with fretfulness and, and feeling like that life is, is spinning out of control? And he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, because you're members of a body that were called to peace. Be thankful. Now, if the, if the hardest thing that he asks us to do is to turn the other cheek, in my opinion, the hardest thing to believe in the Bible is that if I do these things, if I forgive, if I turn the other cheek, if I show grace, that he's going to give me more in return. That's hard to believe. Because almost certainly if I forgive and do all those things, it's going to hurt first. And sometimes when it hurts first, it's really hard to wait for that longer blessing. But what he says is, he says, when you give your life away, you'll find it in the end. When you lay your life down, you'll get it back. On the other hand, if you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it in the end. And he says that several different times in Scripture. And it seems like this is the way the world is set up. When I learn to, to lift up the other person, even if it means me losing a little bit, he's going to bless me more later. And it's a hard thing to trust. I mean, maybe it's the hardest thing. To, to me it is. It's the hardest thing to trust. But, but I think that's the promise. The peace of Christ can, can rule in your heart. You can be a different kind of person. He says, uh, let the message of Christ dwell amongst you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and, and spiritual songs. Singing to God with gratitude, that same, same idea, with peace. Is be thankful. Now, again, show that gratitude. When I remember who I am, I'm just a leper broken by sin. When I remember who I am and I, I show that grace to God and I come back to him and I and I thank him for what he's done, and I thank him for who he's been, and I thank him for how he's saved me. Well, my, I get the peace back. The message of Christ is that, is, that, is that there's hope. You know, there's hope for sinners like us. Let that message dwell in me richly, God. And he, and he, he lists singing there. Um, do do something with me here. S -s Sing this with me. Just uh, it's one you know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I'm gonna stop you here. We're gonna do it again. Two rules. Two rules here. Uh, I, I learned a couple of weeks ago, uh, some, some more than Latin, a couple of several months ago, that, that like one in five or one in six Americans don't sing at all for any reason. They don't sing in the shower. They don't sing in the car. They don't sing. They don't sing. They, don't, they just never do it, never for whatever reason. And, and, uh, and, and so I know there's people who are here. And I know there's also people who, who would normally sing, maybe in the shower or in the car, but they don't sing in front of folks because it would sound like a bad record, like a, like a frog croaking or something, and they don't want anybody to hear that. Okay, so first of all, we're just going to push through that today. That's my, my first request. It's going to push through that today. And then, and then if you know parts, if you can sing the high parts and the low parts, like you, you, you can do that, then do that, right? And, uh, and then I'm going to turn the microphone off. And, and the rule of thumb would be if I'm louder up here than you all are, you need to pick it up a notch. 
All right. See, when I'm in a room like this, it might be hard for me to sing, but I can lean into you singing, and we all lift one another up. And there's something about singing, especially a song like that one, where, I mean, the words, man, God did everything for us. And when I sing the words and I really pour myself into it, and I, and, gratitude in my heart, it changes you. Again, think about that, that first story. The, the, the leper comes back, says, thank you, and Jesus says, this, you're well. I mean, this, this is what turns the key. And then the verse I really wanted to get to was, uh, was this one. All that for context. Whatever you do, he says, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, you ought to have the spirit of gratitude. God has been so good to us. God has been so good to us. You know, you talk to parents who are having trouble with their kid, and it's not an uncommon thing to have the parents say, I just feel like they don't appreciate anything I do. You, you have a husband and wife or or couple dating and uh and uh same thing they just don't appreciate you know they're just that they don't they don't care about anything i do gratitude unlocks the door it, it just it just does and so he says whatever you do whether in word or deed you know do it all through christ and give thanks to god through him i was reading it's been several months ago i read this quote by bill gates bill gates says you know just in terms of allocation of time resources religion's not very efficient there's, not, there's a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning. Now, I don't know if Bill Gates is an atheist or not. He, he may or may not be, but he doesn't care much for church, doesn't care much for religion, doesn't care much for uh, being, being in church. And, 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 uh, and I got to thinking about it when, when I was reading this quote. And, and if you approach church like so many are tempted to approach church, I mostly agree with Bill Gates. If, if you approach church like, what can I get out of this? And you can tell by the language people use, like, like, I didn't get much out of the music, or I didn't get much out of the sermon, or I got a lot out of the sermon. Boy, the sermon really, you know, or, really, or this thing really hit me. Or, and, and it's nothing wrong with any of that. Nothing wrong with any of that. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But, but if you're just going to church for what you can get, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things you could do that give you back more. I mean, if you're going, if your reason to come to church is to get closer as a family, maybe camping on the weekend would do more of that. Or... Uh, or, you know, get, get involved in a lot of sports with your kids. Just travel every weekend. If, if the point of it is, to, is what you get, I mean, you could probably get a lot more done, like Gates says here, if you'll just work on Sunday. Um, if it's just about getting something, you know? Like, like, like I went to church, and I didn't get much out of that, so this next weekend I'm going to go do this and this and this, and that makes 100% sense. I mean, it does. I, don't, I can't really fault anybody who uses that line of logic. That, I mean, that makes sense to me. Uh, Bill Gates, whatever else you think about Bill, he's a smart dude, and I, I think that's probably right. But that was never the reason to go to church. You, 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 you go here to give thanks to God. God, you've been so good to me. I'm not getting anything. I'm giving everything. God, you, you've, I mean, that's why we sing. I mean, I mean, that's why we read our Bible. That's, that's, that's why we, we bring people here. You know, the, the, the gospel's for everyone. That, that's, that's the reason why we try to talk to people and, and get to know about them and, and, and learn and, and, and get close to them. I mean, that's the reason we get in small groups and, and get into people's lives. I mean, it's not what you can get. It's because it's, it's you're given. 
You're the one who's going to serve the other people. That, that's the reason we, people serve here, whether it's serving coffee or donuts or helping with the kids or, or the parking or, or whatever else it is. I mean, I mean, you don't do it so you can get something. You do it to say thank you. Jesus, you've been so good to me, and, and I just want to say thank you. And then when you do that, this weird thing happens, and Jesus, like I said, he promises, as I give myself away, I find my life in the end. And it can only be done that way. I don't do it to control it. I, I give away all the control, and as I give away all the control, I find my life on the other side. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Boy, I'd sure love to have that. How do I do it? Well, you've got to be thankful. You've got to show some gratitude. It's not about you. Sometimes we might have a, a Bible study with, with newer Christians in it, or maybe I'm teaching at a, at a camp thing at youth group, and, and some of will say, I just want to know what God's will is for me. And when they say it, what they're meaning usually is which job to take, which person to date, which, which, uh, where should I live? But the, the Bible tells us what God's will is. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And when I learn to, to be this way, it changes me. It'll change you. I know it seems childish. What do you say to your, to your God? Well, you say, I thank you. And, and you won't always mean it 100%, but there's something so powerful about saying it. So, a couple things. First of all is homework. I've got homework for you. Uh, this week, uh, um, write down every day just three things you're thankful for. Every day, three things you're thankful for. And push yourself a little bit here. Don't just say God, family, and country every day. You know, it, 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 Push yourselves a little. You know, if you say family on day one, then on day two, say something else. Or if you talk about, why? Why are you thankful for your family? Be a little more specific than just family, you know? And, and I know it seems childish, but I've, I've got a friend who's a, who's a psychologist, and he recommends this for patients dealing with depression and anxiety and, and worry that, that, that there's something about saying thank you. Just, just, God, thank you for these blessings. Just two or three blessings every day. There's something about that that brings a person back. And so if you don't want to see it like homework, see it like a science experiment. For, for this one week, every day, just three things a day that you're thankful for. And, and see if God doesn't start changing your heart. See if you don't start understanding him better. And, and, and there's something about it. I don't, I don't understand why it is, but it is. And, and so I want to challenge you to do that. I think um, too often we're, we're just not grateful enough. And especially as we bounce off of one another here at the church and, and in our families and stuff like that, God has been so good to us to give us one another. And, and we can just miss it. You know, this week, uh, some of you are going to have to have dinner with people that you despise. I wish that weren't true. I thought we went to your family last year, you're telling your wife. Yes, we go every year. It's Thanksgiving. and Oh, yeah, I guess. Well, I don't have to talk, do I? I don't want to talk. Can I just go and not talk? And, and you have those kind of conversations. And, uh, and they're just broken by sin. That's why they act the way they do. That's why everybody acts the way they do. So, so you go in with this different attitude. It's Thanksgiving. Give some thanks. You know, what a blessing it is to live in a country where you don't need papers to leave the county. What a blessing it is to, to live in a country where I can go to a grocery store and buy food and it's all there. Whatever I want. What, what, a, what a blessing it is. And if it's any comfort to you, some of those people are saying the same thing about you. Is he going to be there this year? Goodness gracious. I sat beside him last year and time really crawled. And, you know... And so just what a moment this is. And especially for that person who you only get to see once a year. I mean, you can be an influence there. You can be. And I'm not asking you to be somebody you're not. I'm just asking you to put on the hard pants. Go in there and be kind. 
So that's your homework for the week. As we end our service here and, um, and we, uh, we finish up, I want to give anybody a chance who, who needs to call out to God. I really do think still that Jesus saves people. And not just saves them for heaven, but saves them here. That people who are warped by sin and broken can be transformed. I still believe that. I've, I see it. And if you come into this place and you're just beat up with something, you can lay it down. If you come into this place and you're, you're, you're so guilty about things that have happened or went ways they shouldn't, you can come and lay that down. That Jesus will show you grace. And he'll forgive, and he'll forgive every time, because that's what God does. So as we close our service, I want you to know there will be people up in the front that you can pray with about anything. Uh, pray for strength for Thanksgiving if you need to do that. But pray for whatever it is, and, and we'll lift you up and ask God to move in, in you. So I want you to stand up, let the band come back up. Let me pray with you.